This is Dr. Michael Lubarski from Emory University, Department of Radiology, and today we will be talking about increased intracranial pressure, one of the 22 don't miss diagnoses in medical student education. The reason why increased intracranial pressure is important is because it can be imminently deadly. And um, some of the important things about it, uh, the reason why increased intracranial pressure is so deadly is because skull, where the brain is contained, is a closed box and if you have increased pressure within this closed box there is no way uh, nowhere for the brain to expand thereby causing compression of the brain and causing death there are multiple causes to increase the cranial pressure some of them are called intraaxial masses intraaxial meaning inside the brain and mass means something that occupies volume within the brain so if it occupies volume it means it will displace the brain however since the volume within the skull is limited the brain will be compressed instead of being displaced extraaxial masses is another cause extraaxial meaning inside the skull but outside the brain so this mass will occupy volume and compress the brain from the outside another cause is edema edema increases the volume of the brain itself by increasing water content. There are two types of edema. One type of edema is whenever the water content of the brain cells is increased and another type of edema is when the interstitial volume, the volume in between the brain cells, is increased. Additionally, we're going to talk about normal brain, brain parenchyma and cerebrospinal fluid spaces as they pertain to intracranial pressure. And finally, we'll talk about several examples of increased intracranial pressure. Here is some anatomy. Uh, here you can see the brain inside of the skull. As you can see there is not a lot of space within the skull that is not occupied by the brain. That space is primarily occupied by cerebrospinal fluid and some vasculature such as dural venous sinuses. Uh, here's some more anatomy. On uh, the image on the left, which is a CT scan image of the brain, you can see certain structures including the black structures which are the sulci cerebrospinal fluid filled spaces surround the black spaces are surrounded by gyri which are enfoldings of the brain now if you look at one of the gray white matter junctions within a gyri you can see good demarcation between gray matter which is more peripheral and white matter which is darker and more inside and on a correlated anatomic image you can see the same thing. So normally when you have increased intracranial pressure or brain edema these normal spaces and structures become effaced and lost and no longer seen. On this image we can see some additional structures. Those structures are called basilar cisterns. They're called basilar cisterns uh, for two reasons. One, they're called basilar because they're at the base of the brain. They're called cisterns because they contain cerebrospinal fluid. So there's are containers of cerebrospinal fluid at the base of the brain and they also communicate with the ventricular system of the brain. On the image on the left you can see the quadrigeminal plate cistern and the ambient cisterns as pointed out by the green arrow and on the image on the right you can see the supracellar cistern which has a star-shaped appearance. Normally it is a very symmetric structure on occasion whenever you have herniation such as uncle herniation it is becomes not symmetric and it is something you should pay attention to when you're looking at those images additionally on the image on the left we can also see the third ventricle and we also see the lateral ventricles on this next image we can see the frontal horns of, of the lateral ventricles on the CT scan image on the left, we again see the third ventricle posterior to that. And finally, we see the quadrigeminal plate cistern more posteriorly. Lateral to the quadrigeminal plate cistern, we can see the temporal horns of the lateral ventricles. The same anatomy is seen on this anatomic image where the lateral ventricles, the frontal horns, are outlined. As we discussed earlier, as a result of increased intracranial pressure, the brain becomes displaced. The brain usually becomes displaced along the path of least resistance. 
the brain displacement is called herniation and there are different types of herniation depending on where the increased intracranial pressure occurs within the brain. Uh, we'll start, start with a subfalceal herniation also termed midline shift. On this image you can see brain herniating inferior to the falx. Falx is a relatively rigid structure and cannot be displaced. However, brain inferior to that is much easier displaced. Thereby, the herniation usually occurs in this location. Some complications from subfalceal herniation is compression of the anterior cerebral arteries, which would result in infarction of the anterior cerebral artery distribution. Additional type of herniation is tentorial herniation. Tentorium is a reflection of the dura mater that is inferior to the brain. It separates the cerebellum and the brain. So whenever we have tentorial herniation, either the brain herniates inferiorly or the cerebellum herniates superiorly, compressing the brain or the cerebellum. Additionally, uncle herniation is herniation of the uncus. Uncus is the most medial portion of the temporal lobe. Whenever the uncus herniates, it herniates towards the opposite side and the structure that it often compresses is the brainstem, which is vital to survival. If the brainstem is compressed, often death ensues unless that is corrected. Additionally, tonsillar herniation is herniation of the cerebellar tonsils inferiorly through the frame and magnum. Normally, the only structure that occupies the frame and magnum is medulla and the spinal cord. If additional structures start to occupying it, the spinal cord can become compressed, thereby causing death. Finally, external herniation is herniation of the brain outside of the cranium. That occurs whenever the normal skull is disrupted and the patient underwent a craniectomy, meaning removal of part of the skull. Thereby, the path of least resistance becomes through that opening. On this slide, we can see an example of subfalcian herniation and midline shift. As you can see on the image on the left, which is a CT scan image, there is a hemorrhage between the skull and the brain, pushing the brain to the left. And again, we can see the falx right here, which is rarely displaced. As we discussed, that is a relatively rigid structure. Thereby, the path of least resistance is a subfalceal, meaning posterior to the falx, herniation of the brain and the brain herniates, everything gets displaced to the side. Additionally, on this image you can see what's called ventricular entrapment. The left ventricle is dilated, thereby indicating that it is not draining well. Ventricular entrapment means poor drainage of the ventricle. The right ventricle, on the other hand, is compressed. On the image on the left, we can see the same thing, uh, just anatomically. Again, subfalcian herniation, and displacement of most of the brain to the left. Uh, this image demonstrates a very similar appearance as a result of an epidural hematoma where we have subfalceal herniation also known as we said midline shift. This is another example of subfalcian herniation as a result of a subdural hematoma. As you can see subfalcian brain is displaced to the left and the right ventricle is compressed by this mass effect. As we discussed another herniation is tonsillar herniation where the tonsils herniate into the frame and magnum thereby occupying the space within the frame and magnum and often compressing the spinal cord. On this image you can see the spinal cord outlined more anteriorly and cerebellar tonsils outlined more, more posteriorly. On the anatomic image, you can see significant compression of the spinal cord by the cerebellar tonsils. This is an as another example of the tonsillar herniation. On the image on the left, normal, uh, we don't see any cerebrospinal fluid. We just see the spinal cord and cerebellar tonsils filling the entire space. On the sagittal image on the left, we see the same thing. Marked compression of the spinal cord by the cerebellar tonsils. Additionally, uh, let's talk about cerebral edema. This is an example of a patient who developed cerebral edema. Image on the left is before they developed the cerebellar edema. Cerebral edema.
uh, as you can see we have a well-defined sulcus as well as well-defined gyri and we can also see some gray white matter differentiation here where you can see the gray matter being a little brighter and the white matter being a little bit darker on the image on the left the patient has developed cerebral edema and we no longer see any cerebrospinal fluid spaces additionally we don't really see any significant differentiation between the gray and white matter we're losing contrast also indicative of cerebral edema this is an example of uncle herniation in this patient as you can see there is no cerebrospinal fluid space between the uncus which is the most medial portion of the temporal lobe and the brain stem these are some images of uncle herniation on the image on the left you can see very narrow very narrow quadrigeminal and ambient plate cisterns bilaterally indicating contact between the uncus and the brainstem. If there is contact between these two structures it means there is mass effect on the brainstem and brainstem will not function normally. On the image in the middle we can see left-sided uncle herniation where the right-sided quadrigeminal plate cistern is much bigger than the one on the left indicating that the left-sided uncus has herniated onto the brainstem and causing mass effect on it. Additionally, on the image on the left, we can see an entrapped temporal horn of the left lateral ventricle. Finally, on the image on the right of the screen, we can see loss of gray white matter differentiation consistent with cerebral edema and also, again, loss of the basilar cisterns where there is contact between the temporal lobes and the brain stem indicating mass effect. Finally, here's another example of an entrapped ventricle. As we discussed earlier, the temporal horn on the left side is dilated, indicating that it doesn't drain well. If it doesn't drain well, it means this is essentially a localized hydrocephalus, also termed entrapped ventricle. Here's an example of external herniation. On this image, the patient underwent a craniectomy, meaning removal of part of the skull. As a result, the path of least resistance becomes the area where there is no skull and the brain if it is edematous or swollen or if there is some kind of mass effect from a mass tends to go through the path of least resistance and herniate through that defect it is also indicative of persistent mass effect thank you very much